Yeah, yeah spread yeah. out across, I guess that works. Okay. Good afternoon. The killing of George Floyd has forever changed the intersection at 38th and Chicago and has forever changed and reshaped our city's place in history. Uh, the events that happened on May 25th, uh, 2020, have forced everyone in our city across the nation and the world to come to a global reckoning with our shortcomings on racial injustices and systemic racism. But amid that darkness, the community came forward and they managed to shine a light on 38th in Chicago in a beautiful way to memorialize George Floyd, uh, to rally around a common cause, which is social and racial justice. They came forward with vibrant art, heartfelt offerings with a memorial. Uh, you had business leaders, you had community members, all pushing forward in a way that left an indelible impression for anyone that visited 38th in Chicago. It was in and of itself a beautiful thing. But the intervening months have been far less straightforward. The barricades that were originally placed uh, at the intersection to protect both people as well as the public art are now in many senses used as a screen for illicit activity and have re-traumatized a neighborhood that has already experienced far too much over the last year. We've received quite a bit of correspondence over the last several months from neighbors that are in some cases being re-traumatized and I wanted to share that with you. One from November reads, do something, anything, more gunshots last night, getaway cars driving at 40 miles an hour. Another, just a few days later, we feel so very helpless. Who do we talk to about the difficulty of living there and not having a voice? At the end of the year, Mr. Floyd's death was gut-wrenching and a travesty, which is why when violence like this takes place in the area, many people I know are afraid to visit the memorial. So there are two dynamics that are taking place. We have to acknowledge both truths at the same time. Small businesses, several of them, uh, several of them BIPOC-owned, have been denied a fair shot, not, ju not just by COVID-19, but by the events that have happened in the, uh, in the months that have come after May 25th. The people who live and own businesses near 38th and Chicago have found themselves at the center of a global reckoning. They didn't ask for this, but they have stepped up in an extraordinary way. The truth is that the situation at hand is not sustainable. We are united in that understanding. We are united in that understanding, and we are united in this plan moving forward. In creating this plan, uh, there are three realities that we need to acknowledge. First. The intersection at 38th and Chicago has forever been changed. We are not going back to normal at that intersection. The future must acknowledge the space as a memorial for George Floyd, for his life, and the future must have 38th and Chicago and that intersection be a center for racial healing and justice. That's point number one. Point number two, there is a trial, as we know, that will begin in early March. Uh, that trial will uh, be a piece that will trigger a whole lot of trauma in community. It will be a difficult time, and we know that 38th in Chicago will be an important gathering place. Number three, this is not an autonomous zone, and it will not and cannot be an autonomous zone. The neighborhood and the community around there have, have stated very clearly that they expect robust city service and access, and we will provide it. And that is everything from the core city services that people expect from snow clearance to um, maintenance uh, to, yes, EMS and 911 response. So we will be providing those robust services, and the community should expect that robust service leading up to the trial. However, through the trial, the area will remain closed to vehicular access. So, just to be clear, closed to vehicular access, not closed in any way, shape, or form to city service. In fact, the city service that we provide will be enhanced in that area. So the people who join or are joining me here today uh, have been united in this plan. We've been working extraordinary, extraordinarily hard over the last several months, 
and you'll be hearing from them directly about their plans, whether that those plans involve the 911 response or involve the public works improvements that we want to see. And by the way, we will be moving forward in a substantial way to memorialize George Floyd, to memorialize his life, and to make this space an ongoing uh, location for racial justice and healing. Part of that, obviously, is in the way the intersection is shaped. In determining how the intersection is shaped, we wanted to hear directly from community, and so we will be putting out a survey, a community-wide survey, so that they can literally vote on the preference that is preferred, and our director of public works, Brett Jelly, will be discussing that very shortly. So in conclusion, it is our responsibility as city leaders uh, and as community to honor George Floyd's life, to create this space that I've just discussed. Um, the magnitude of these decisions is not lost on me. I know there's a great deal of frustration and pain in community, and how we as a community come, choose to move forward must honor that pain and frustration, and it must prioritize healing. We've been in, co in contact with a number of different community members as well as multiple jurisdictions uh, to, to figure out how we best move forward. Um, and with that, I will be turning it over to Council Member Kano, who is one of the two council members that represent that intersection. The second is Council Vice President Jenkins, who's entering right now. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Alondra Cano, and I'm the council member for the Ninth Ward. Um, as many of you know, we are close to the one-year marker of the loss of Mr. Floyd. And over the course of that time, we have learned a lot about the powerful symbolism and significance of this moment in time, not only for our city, but for the country. And as such, I am thankful to share that for more than 10 months, council members, our mayor, our city staff, our chief, have all been extremely engaged on the ground, talking to residents, business owners, nonprofit leaders, newcomers, visitors, homeowners, resident tenants, all who really expressed the need to be able to provide safety and justice for this community. I stand here before you today with full confidence that we can, that we have, and that we will deliver on both. I have been very privileged to be able to work with our team here, our mayor, our council vice president, um, council member Jenkins. I have seen the deep work we have all done together to engage with residents of this area, people who care about the future of Minneapolis, people who care about Mr. Floyd and his family. And I feel good about the fact that we did make available more than $10 million as the mayor and the council for investments in this area that can physically move us towards racial justice and racial equity. I have been very impressed with the many, many groups and organizations that we have engaged to discuss how do we support this community and move forward in healing. So today, knowing that we expect a difficult month in March and that the one-year marker will come in May, we're here to stand together to say we are going to support our city through this. We are going to be a positive example on how to deliver on safety, on justice, on healing. And Councilmember Jenkins will likely talk about truth and reconciliation, which has been a primary value for me in this conversation since day one. So thank you all for being here. We will be available for questions as well afterwards. Thank you, Council Member, and for all of your work over the last several months. Uh, next up is, is Council Vice President here. Okay. Uh, next we have Chief Arredondo. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Councilmember Cano. Uh, as Chief of the Minneapolis Police Department, I have a deep, profound understanding of the significance of what brought our city and certainly the intersection of 38th and Chicago uh, to where it is today. And so I want to just take a moment to, to name that. 
Uh, over the past uh, year, uh, I certainly have been in conversations with community, um, specifically in the 38th and Chicago area. I was just recently there uh, this Tuesday talking to community members uh, over at the square. So here is where, uh, over the past year, where those conversations and that engagement has led me as chief of police. Um, I'm responsible for the public safety of all four corners of this city. Uh, I also know that hope and resiliency can erode in time over long periods of suffering. And many of our neighbors in that community have felt that they've suffered, the businesses, the residents, and visitors. And so I cannot allow that to happen. As Mayor Fry indicated, uh, 38th in Chicago is not an autonomous zone. While there are environmental challenges with the way the current intersection is, uh, our men and women will continue to show up and respond and to be the guardians of that community when they call us for help. But the intersection must open, and it must open with an intentional and thoughtful and compassionate way that all of my city leadership and colleagues are doing. Uh, the number of people in this room today, what 30th in Chicago really is all about, it's about wellness. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that wellness helps to cultivate the best in our humanity. And I'm proud to team up with not only our leadership and our, my other colleagues here from the uh, city of Minneapolis, but walking in step with community. So when we get to that point of reopening, the Minneapolis Police Department will play a role in that, but we will play a role in it in con concert with, in collaboration with our community stakeholders. And so there'll be continued conversation, there'll be tough conversations, but I will tell you that um, the people that I've spoken with, they wanna get to that point of healing that Councilmember Collin talked about. And we all need to stand with them together as we go down that journey. So um, I will pause at this point, but I'm, I'm very, uh, I wanna thank the community that's been out there. I recognize the pain, the trauma that they've experienced um, and I will continue to support them in the manner in which that I can. Uh, but I also feel very confident with the leadership here and uh, my, my fellow colleagues in the city enterprise department that we will get to a place in concert with our community uh, that uplifts 38th in Chicago and uh, moves us toward a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Fry, and all of my colleagues, um, Chief Aaron Dondo. You know, I am here to just uh, express my support for this plan to really think about how do we begin to heal our community. And, and I think um, beginning the process of reopening is uh, a really important step in that process. Uh, 2020 has been an extraordinarily challenging year for, for everyone, but even more specifically for the people who have been um, really rallying around uh, what has now become George Floyd Square and, and building community and building um, just a sense of togetherness. I think the, the tragic murder of George Floyd has really created an opportunity for uh, people who have been marginalized, who have been left out of uh, processes uh, throughout our communities. And it's, it's given people a, a chance to feel like they are contributing, like they are making a difference and that's really important, and I absolutely support that, which is why, you know, we have been working with the Office of Violence Prevention to, um, to help build the capacity of some of those organizations. Um, they, there's a project called the Blueprint um, Approved Institute Fellowship, and we have supported a number of organizations in that uh, specific community to build their own capacity to become uh, community leaders. Organizations like 612 MASH, the Agape Movement, Becoming a Man Project, the Gatekeepers Ministry, and the Touch Outreach. 
And so, you know, we really want to see this community continue to thrive, continue to build, but reopening, reconnecting this area to the rest of the city is the utmost importance in making that happen. We are being responsive to the needs of the community in terms of jobs and job development and working with groups like Summit Academy and hopefully potentially other organizations like PPL um, and some of our other training and employment partners to bring training opportunities and job opportunities to this area, home ownership opportunities. Certainly, um, Council Member uh, Cano mentioned the truth and reconciliation process that the city is beginning to embark upon and really get down to the the real foundational issues that are pulling our communities apart and beginning to address those um, through that process. I absolutely um, believe and understand that racism is at the root of all of our problems in our city, in our country, and until we tackle that pernicious issue, we will continue to have these same kinds of problems in our community. So to that end, you know, we declared racism as a public health crisis to be able to begin to, to undo some of those things and to help people become anti-racist so that we can heal, so that we can build and bring our communities together. That is the hope that I have. That's the intention of this proposed uh, plan, and um, we are willing to work with all of the community members to bring that to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President. Next up is our Interim Director of Public Works, Rick Dilley. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Uh, my name is Brett Jelly. I am the interim director of Public Works. My name is B R E T T E. Last name is spelled H J E L L E. I'd like to share information on two items. Uh, the first is the services we've been we are providing to the area today, and will continue to provide to the area, and explain the street reconnection plan. Public Works has been providing services to 38th and Chicago since last spring. We realized uh, it was very important to support the intersection with services to support the really important uh, mourning and reflection that, have, that were happening uh, in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's murder. Services have included traffic signs and barricades to protect pedestrians in the area while preserving emergency and service vehicle access. We have been providing regular solid waste services to the memorial area and to the homes in the area. And we have also been providing snow and ice control uh, this winter. Services will continue. We have also are planning lighting improvements, uh, traffic calming, and we're providing enhanced snow and ice services and hauling snow out as needed. Our reconnection of the intersection, uh, the work around that started this past summer and fall when the city engaged the community on interim road design options. We heard several priorities during that process, including preserving space for mourning and reflection, protecting art, providing residents and businesses access, and restoring transit services. We are using that work now and are recommending one of the options presented this fall. The option preserves memorial space and art while providing two-way traffic operations in all directions. This option also provides business and residential access and provides the opportunity to restore transit service on Chicago Avenue and 38th Street. There are two options, uh, two variations within this plan, and they relate to the location of the fist sculpture. So our next step is to send a survey to area residents asking for their preference. We expect surveys to arrive in, in the community in a few weeks and should have results a few weeks after that. Once the design option is determined, we will begin work 
on the intersection as weather allows with the goal of having the street reopen to traffic once the Derek Chauvin trial concludes. Thank you, Interim Director. Uh, next is our Director of CPED, Andrea Brennan. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I'm Andrea Brennan, Interim Director of CPED. That's A-N-D-R-E-A, -E Brennan, B-R-E-N-N-A-N. -N -N. Um, good afternoon. A central focus of the work of the Community Planning and Economic Development, or CPED Department, is developing our workforce, especially our young workforce, and supporting housing stability, especially for black, indigenous, and people of color residents who have not benefited equally from economic growth. For workforce development outreach, I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing. Um, CPED is supporting workforce development and career pathways that are culturally specific to give young people in the 38th and Chicago area in addition to leveraging the city's nationally recognized Step Up Summer Internship Program, workforce partners also include, but are not limited to, Project for Pride in Living and Summit Academy OIC. An essential part of our efforts is helping to prepare workers for careers that sustain families and, and strengthen communities. The goal is simple. Offer training, jobs, and educational opportunities to those that have traditionally been shut out economically. This is, this is accomplished through direct outreach and community partnerships led by local community organizations committed to preparing young people for the work world. We intend to reach as many Minneapolis low-income and BIPOC youth through our Step Up Summer Youth Internship Program that we can just as we did last summer, serving more than 1,800 Minneapolis youth. Anyone with available jobs, internships, or grant funding, please connect with us. We're always interested in partnering. On the housing front, the city continues to support housing stability, prevent involuntary displacement, expand our homeless response system, and invest a record high number of new affordable housing units. As an early housing response to the pandemic in 2020, the city created an emergency housing assistance program that served more than 1,600 Minneapolis low-income households. The city will be launching a new emergency housing assistance program in March with new federal funding provided under the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act. In addition, in late 2020, the city provided grant funding under a new pilot program designated uh, to provide housing stability, housing stabilization, advocacy, and homeownership readiness services to renters in one to four unit properties. Four organizations that serve residents in the 38th and Chicago area received a total of $870,000 in city funding for this purpose. These organizations include Powderhorn Park, Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association, Hispanic Advocacy and Community Empowerment Through Research, Lutheran Social Services, and the NIA Project. Information about how to contact these organizations is on our website. Also on our website um, is updated information regularly on additional housing supports that the city is supporting and making available. Thank you. With that, we'll open it to questions. Uh, and by so the question was, what are the proposed plans? And by proposed plans, you're talking about the public works improvements for the area. Right. So the public works improvements for the area should be in the plan that was provided to you. Um, there are two different options, both of which include space in the public right of way for a, a public memorial for George Floyd, uh, as well as public art. Um, now, each one of the plans have a couple of different specifics, and, and the, the main piece is where the fist itself could ultimately be placed, whether it would be in the middle of the intersection as a roundabout or it would be on the side. We want to listen to community, and you know, what better way to, to listen to community than contacting them quite directly and asking every single individual that lives or, or works as a business in the area um, what they think. And so that, that, that is the, 
that is the direction we're going in terms of the survey. Following the results of the survey, uh, we'll be able to implement the vision that community is hoping for. Can you talk a little bit more about the timing of this? Um, so this will, the, the goal is to reopen this following going down? That's right. Um, so the question was, can we talk a little bit more about the timing of it? And I'll probably bring uh, our director, Jelly, up in just a second here. Um, we hope to get the survey out as soon as possible. Um, it's being drafted literally right now. Uh, once the draft is approved, it can be sent. Uh, of course, we'll give a certain number of, of days for individuals and community to respond to that survey. We'll collect the results, tally them up, uh, and determine which direction we're going to go. Now, either one of the options includes, I should say both of the options include a memorial in largely the same place uh, where George Floyd was killed. You know, we've heard loud and clear from, uh, from residents, from community, uh, we've heard directly from the fiance of George Floyd uh, that she felt very strongly about never again having tires run over that sacred space where George Floyd was killed, and we agree. We want to make sure that that space is protected and it will be protected and bolstered with a, a barrier that prevents traffic from ever again running over it. Now, along with that will be space as well as resources to provide the memorial itself. And I don't think that it's up to me to provide the vision uh, for what that memorial should be. I think community um, is, should be ultimately listened to and we should execute based on their, um, their wishes. The question was, what happens between now and that time period following the trial when the intersection is open to vehicular traffic? Uh, I'll, I can bring our chief up here in just a second, but uh, one of the main pieces that we all felt strongly about was that this area should not just get basic and core city services, it should be bolstered. Uh, so that, that area will get robust city service, whether that is uh, snow removal and plowing, or 911 response and EMS. Uh, we want to make sure that that area is fully accessible for all of those core city services that residents and businesses expect. Uh, it will be it continue to be closed for vehicular traffic, and a big reason for that is we recognize the reality that the trial is coming in a matter of weeks. Um, during the trial, we know that 38th and Chicago will be a very important gathering space for community. We don't want to take that away from them. Uh, we recognize that. That's just a truth. Um, and so uh, the closure to vehicular traffic on a temporary basis while the city enhances the core city services that will be located around that area is going to be really important. And in addition to that, we're working, for, we're, we're working towards a number of different workforce uh, uh, improvement options so, so that you know, if youth have full access to, to jobs and training, uh, we'll have an outreach program that's in place, and we'll be working with a number of different community organizations uh, to make sure that we're engaging properly around that. Mayor, I have a question. Just having been down there, and I'm, I'm going to refer to him as the, the tech wars on the ground there. I know you've been, I don't know if you want to call it negotiating, but exchanging letters. What if they just do not want to leave? And they say that they practice kind of filling up the barricades, expecting any time that someone's going to show up and move them. I mean, is the city physically prepared to move these people out? come the aftermath of the Chauvin trial? So the, the question was regarding the, the protectors and, and advocates that are presently in the area. And, you know, I've, I've realized this more and more through the last eight months is that, you know, we all have a, a role to play in moving society forward. And I fully understand their presence and I fully understand what they're seeking, which is justice. And they're seeking dramatic transformational change in terms of how we operate as a city, not just in the police department, but in terms of economic inclusion. Uh, and uh, collectively, we've, we've met with them on uh, numerous occasions. Uh, we've heard them out. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, one of their key asks has been to have this space be one of racial justice and healing. One of their key asks is to not go back to normal, uh, and we do not intend to do so. Now, Will this intersection ultimately be reopened? That is, of course, the intention. Um, and yes, it will be. Uh, it, but for the, in, in the present state, we wanted to make sure that there are robust and enhanced city services that are being delivered. And, and that's the direction we're going to go. So 
So the question was, what happens in the interim before the trial is complete and the jury verdict has been read? Um, so in the interim, a number of things are going to happen. Uh, first, we will be offering enhanced city services to that area. And we've gone through a, a laundry list of what that will ultimately look like. Uh, second, uh, we are working towards a workforce program um, it, for that area that will specifically focus on youth. Um, third, there's a number of, of different offerings through CPED, our Community Planning and Economic Development Department, uh, that, that, that could assist with everything from uh, facade improvements and grants to our Commercial Property Development Fund, which will allow some of these BIPOC business owners uh, not just to own their underlying business, but to ultimately own the underlying property, allowing them to, to reap the benefits of any economic gains that are, that are seen. Um, now, the, now, as I mentioned, the intersection will be closed uh, to vehicular traffic, noting the reality that, that during the trial, people are going to want to gather. It's going to be a traumatic time for our city. And we want to make sure that during that very difficult period, people have the uh, ability to, to be with one another, of course, accounting for the pandemic, uh, and, and to heal. Um, and and that's, that's, that's for anybody. Uh, and we feel that it's safest to keep those city barricades there on a temporary basis to keep people safe, to keep the art safe, and to keep the, our city workers that will be providing service on an ongoing basis safe as well. We hear them loud and clear, and none of us are up here today to make any excuses. Um, our city has confronted challenges over the last eight months that we have never seen before uh, in history. Uh, but to your point, the proof will be in actions, not in words. Um, and what we intend to show over the next several weeks uh, is that uh, the, anybody in community who has been frustrated, they are heard, they are seen. Uh, and the city will be providing robust and core city services to not just that intersection, but the surrounding community as well. How many calls for service uh, via 911, 311 for that matter, uh, has the city received um, in the process that it's made uh, in that area? So the question is how many uh, calls for 911 and or 311 uh, service have, have been made uh, for that area. I do not know the answer to it offhand. Uh, we can get you that information. Yeah. Can, can, can we just get a quick assessment, just given kind of, you know, up here at the, where we are with policing? I mean, I know we need a robust city service. There's no ice, garbage collection. Where are we with police? I mean, we see social media videos out of there that you've got your, your teams are still, seem to be stopped at barricades quite a bit and, you know, engage with uh, protectors. And I'm just kind of curious right now, can, can you send a squad in there if, if, if there's a shooting badge at Cup Foods or something? Uh, so the question being, where are we at right now in terms of our Minneapolis Police Department in our response uh, to the intersection of 38th and Chicago? So uh, again, there's the environmental design by its nature is, is really not conducive to uh, that free flow of traffic. And oftentimes when our officers have to respond, if it's an emergency call, uh, whether it be fire or EMS, uh, it's, it's obviously better to have an intersection that's, that's widely open. Obviously, we are also very sensitive to um, uh, the space that folks are holding there. And so we have done a great job. I want to commend the third precinct supervisors particularly, who've done a, a, a very good job under those circumstances, having a developing a, a communication uh, liaison with some of the event organizers out there. I think that that has, uh, that has helped. Um, but to the same point, um, there are still um, there's still improvements that need to be made, and um, with the reopening, it will just continue to help us provide those robust services, as the mayor had mentioned, in a, in a, in a timely fashion. And so we're continuing to continue to work on that. I was just out there again this Tuesday, um, but I will tell you that uh, the conversations that I've had, folks respect and recognize the importance of making sure that as a city, um, we're really respecting and honoring that space and, and uh, the memorial. Uh, but at the same time, um, they, they, they're ready 
they're ready to, uh, to open that up. And so uh, we will work alongside them and as well as our other city partner. And you kind of parse that language. I mean, can a squad go in there to a house right now? If, if someone calls me in for 911 service, or is that the ambulance and fire that's allowed in? Typically, what's happening operationally right now um, squads, obviously, based on the uh, the area of that intersection, if they need to park up as close as they can to get into 30th and Chicago, they certainly will. Uh, what has happened over the last several months, as soon as the event organizer should recognize one of our officers in uniform, they'll approach them, ask them, can we assist? Where are you going? Which house? And and they'll, they'll do that. Now, have there been some challenges? Absolutely. Uh, but this is another reason why we're all here, at least in terms of the public safety piece, that we need to improve that and getting that intersection opened up will help our men and women to respond as adequately and as professionally uh, and as empathetically as they can. I'll note one other piece in, in, in response to that, to that question, which is that our chief uh, and our police officers have been doing absolutely everything they can under very difficult circumstances, uh, especially with the attrition that has been uh, widely reported. Um, uh, we are going to need additional assistance. Uh, I've, I've said that clearly, and, and, it's, and it's not just through the, the, the trial, and of, of course we have robust plans and we will be prepared um, to make sure that everyone in our city is safe through that very difficult time. There will be, by the way, a briefing that you all will receive early to mid next week, and then those briefings will continue up to and then throughout the entire trial. Uh, and then uh, after the trial, we will also uh, need assistance uh, in making sure that uh, we can reopen that intersection as safely as possible. Thank you so much.